Welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast, where hunters new and old come to learn and find inspiration from stories of hunts gone by. Everyone is welcome to enjoy the outdoor way of life, and there is no better time to start than right now. So let's head into the great outdoors with your host, Dylan Ray. All right, guys, welcome to Bear Archery's Hunting 101 podcast. I'm joined by two buddies of mine, Mr. Montana McKean. That's how it comes up on my screen, at least. How are you, Andrew? I'm great, Dylan. Or as I should call you, Heather. Yes. It's apparently your uh, stage name. Shout out to Heather Knight for the Zoom. Um, She's she's hooking us up with the availability to a Zoom meeting today. Andrew, give us a quick introduction to yourself, man. Well, yeah, I am the Montana McKean, I guess. Uh, Freelance writer, uh, idol of America's youth, live in Glasgow, Montana, where we are, you know, I always have to bring the weather in. Uh, We'll hear the train at some point in this call. I think we might hit 100 degrees this week. Really? Well, here in Kansas, it's nice and cool this week. It's been nice. 72 right now. 87. 72 and cloudy, um, perfect weather. I love it. And we have Mr. Brooks Hansen. Brooks, how are you? I'm doing good, man. Doing good, Dylan. Thanks for uh, having me on. I'm excited to talk to Andrew because he's such a wealth of knowledge. (laughs) Yeah, I uh, our pre-conversation recording uh, proved that this podcast is going to be a good one. Or unlistenable. You know, it goes one way or the other. <laughs> now, Brooks, uh, bef- before we jump in, uh, give us a quick introduction to yourself and what all you do over there at Camp Chef. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Brooks Hansen. I work at Camp Chef. Uh, on the weekends, I'm the janitor. The weekdays, I'm the floor sweeper. <laughs> I run what I call the Zamboni in the warehouse just to keep the, the floors clean so we can get product out the door. And then once in a while, I do a little bit of communications with a lot of the outdoor riders and uh, whatever else they have me do. So, so is, that how you, is that how you became friends with Mr. Montana over here? We actually made it or met. We didn't make anything, but we met um, at a club in Vegas once. So that's, that's where we first met. Is that right, Andrew? I think that's right. I mean, it was real dark. Uh, I could have been anybody, and you were anybody, but I think that may be where we got. I'm anxious to know what kind of club this was. <laughs> it was like a trade show club. There might have been some hand holding. <laughs> well, you know, we've held hands. We've held hands in better places than Vegas. I mean, we've yeah. camped together a few times. Yeah, we've yeah we together. have. Not only a little bit, but. Uh, I don't know. We've gone back yeah. a long time. I came to your homeland. Do you remember the gun and optics test? Extraordinary. Oh, you... oh yes. Yes, I remember sitting in the cold with um, checkerboard circle spinning at every 15 seconds um, while you looked at me through a spotting scope. So... Hey, well, at least it wasn't a rifle scope. <laughs> yes. Well, they, they were, there was rifle scopes, too. They were just on tripods, not guns. So what Brooks and I are referring to is I... Uh, I am still, I used to be the editor-in-chief of Outdoor Life, but I uh, was the once and future and current optics editor of Outdoor Life, and we dragooned Brooks into helping with the annual optics test. In fact, he was gracious enough to invite us to his homeland of northern Utah, where we where we saw lots of magnified images. Uh, and the, the one thing the optics test requires is a sharp eye, you'd call it, uh, critical thoughts, the ability to articulate your thoughts in a way that uh, audience would understand. And the one person who possesses none of that gets to turn the resolution wheels. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, I'll tell you what, my eyes were opened with how rigorous and how detailed those optics tests were. Like I've always grown up like reading about the optics tests. I was like, well, how much detail really goes into this? But seeing it firsthand, I was amazed. It was so cool, and you can really see how they perform in all those situations. So that that was really cool. Do you just do scopes, or have you done binoculars and, and spotting scopes and all that good stuff, too? Oh, yeah. Uh, all of the above. I think we're in – I've kind of lost track. We're in our 21st or 22nd year of it. Um, so the, the kind of hallmarks of it are rifle scopes, binoculars, and spotting scopes. But it's, it's actually been a really interesting evolution of the – test which reflects the evolution of the industry so 
you know, with all of the rise of precision rifle scopes, now we've got a whole category devoted to precision rifle scopes versus like the more versatile scopes used for hunting and target stuff. This year, we actually have thermal optics or thermal um, viewers in the test for the first time too. So Brooks, if you're not doing anything over the next old month, why don't you come on up and help? <laughs> That'd be awesome. Are you doing it up in uh, Glasgow again? We are doing it in Glasgow. Uh, I've been kind of chipping away at it, but I'm going to be on the road this week. When I get back, uh, I'm going to hit it pretty hard. Beautiful timing. Uh, you know, up here, in, we're 60 miles from Canada. It doesn't get fully dark until about 12, 15 at night. And then it gets light again at about 2.45 in the morning. So our low light test is a late affair. And we're also combating mosquitoes the size of ravens. So that's cool. It sounds, in fact, I'll be there. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know much about optics. So I picked a good set and that's just what I've always ran. Uh, so tell me if my, my, um, my conclusions were correct. And tell me how you feel about Koa optics spotting scopes. Oh, uh, Koa optics are actually, it's beautiful Japanese glass. They're really nice. Have you ever, so we actually don't have one in the test. We haven't had one in the test for a few years. Um, the last Koa we actually had in the test was the gigantic tripod mounted binocular weighs about, I don't know, 47 pounds, but you could see, uh, the freckle on a, an alligator in Florida from where I'm doing the test. <laughs> They're be and the cool thing is they kind of were precursors to the Swarovski 15 by 56 and all those big format binoculars because you can spend all day with both your eyes open and you don't get eye fatigue. Like you get trying to scrunch up one eye in a spotting scope. So, no, oh, they're a good brand. Now that is, uh, you know, I've actually never looked through those. Um, I, I've heard fantastic things about them, uh, but I run the, um, the 773 series, um, which for me was just really good middle ground. Um, not too big, not too small. They have a really compact small spotting scope, but for me, uh, I mean, lightweight and small is good, but I wanted the middle ground of, of really good optics, but not getting too big. You would, uh, you're would you what we call the Goldilocks customer. <clears throat> not too little, not too big, just right. Just in the middle, yep. No, uh, and, and really reason being is I'm the kind of guy that um, I want one thing to work for everything. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have four spotting scopes and depending on what I'm hunting or where I'm hunting, I take a different one, uh, or even binoculars for, for, uh, for that matter. Um, even down in my boots, you know, I just find a good middle ground that'll work for everything. And, and, uh, that's just always what I use. So uh, I did go right there in the middle, but I was just curious to know, because, you know, I've talked to you about optics in the past and, uh, I am not knowledgeable whatsoever about optics. And so I always like to get the experts um, confirmation of, yeah, you picked a decent one. I hope I've made you feel better about yourself. A little bit. Andrew really has a way about him of making others feel good about themselves. <laughs> I, my self-esteem actually just from this conversation has increased by at least 7%. <laughs> speaking of that, speaking around, uh, speaking about being around Andrew McKean, um, shameless plug, Pope and Young Convention, July 14th through the 17th. Mr. McKean is going to be there live and in person. I'm excited to get to spend the week with you. And uh, if you're in the area, come check us out. It's going to be a good time. Um, Andrew is going to be covering the convention with his writings and his his beautiful articulated articles. Is that – are they beautiful, beautifully articulated? Well, the way you describe them, it sounds like they'd go around a corner nicely. Yeah, they would. <laughs> no but i'm excited uh, i'm excited to uh to be there with you it's gonna be a good time so uh, if you are in the area come check out the pope and young convention july 14th through the 17th um all right well let's dive in now that we have had the longest intro to a podcast in, in history um andrew a while back i think you said 2019 you wrote a article about a new scoring method um which i personally am i, I loved it i fell in love with the idea of it uh, I'm not one that scores my animals based off of inches. Um, yeah, you heard that correct. I'm the marketing director of Pope and Young, and I don't score my animals. Um, but I really, I love the idea that you presented with this new scoring method. So we've got Brooks here, um, who works for the, the the powerhouse of Camp Chef. So let's dive into 
um, your new scoring method, and then let's talk some cooking of wild game because I'm a huge fan of cooking wild game. Well, they are related. They're act they actually are inextricably related because the um, what do we call it? The total palatability index was a way of trying to assess the meat value of animals rather than their un inedible antler qualities. Um, and Brooks being the master chef and mastermind at Camp Chef, uh, an awful lot of animals that score high on the old TPI end up uh, in the Camp Chef at my house, on the Camp Chef, in the Camp Chef, around the Camp Chef. And so it really is, this is a really good way to bring it all together. So the origin of this, um, it's funny when Dylan asked me to be on the show, I was like, yeah, I, I remember vague details of it but this is one of the problems with being a content producer is after a while i'm like what was that what were the details i feel like i'm in anatomy class how many bones are there in the body what is it what are they called said every doctor who's ever operated on you um but, but that was the origin of this deal was i think it was after a hunting season where i had probably one too many buddies uh say oh that's a cool deer what did he score what did he score? You know, that's kind of the first, that's what we default to when we see a picture of, you know, a, of a nice buck or a bull or an animal. And, and, and I'm as guilty as anybody about like measuring the value of that animal by inches of antler. And partly it's because that's what we have in common. That's our, that's our language. Um, but I was proposing that we look at maybe the real value of the animal, at least in my household, I guess you could call it subsistence hunters in the sense that we, you know, we're hunting for food and, and sometimes that big gnarly buck is certainly fun to measure and fun to talk about inches of antler, but it's not as fun when it comes time to eat it. So the total palatability index was really an, a way to say, okay, maybe it doesn't score that well. In fact, it may not have antlers at all, but here are the elements of the TPI. So I'm going to read just a little bit. Um, the ingredients include the TMI, and that's not what Brooks thinks it is. <laughs> it's the total meat index. And this, as I said, is poundage, pure and simple. So a mature bull elk will have a higher TMI than a fox squirrel. But uh, this also gets to the sort of secondary parts of the, of the hunt. A clean shot will guarantee a higher TMI than a poor shot, just because there's more useful meat at the end of the uh, ordeal. And also taking care of it in the field. So uh, you know, the, the more meat you can bring home, the higher the total meat index. And then this will appeal to Brooks. There's the palatability quotient, the PQ, as they call it in the trade. This is the measurement of taste and tenderness of the meat. So a high PQ is achieved through, as I'm saying here, a number of variables, including the youth and sex of the animal. A young white tail doe will have a higher PQ. Um, then I also mentioned, um, looking past uh, at this piece I wrote in 2019, a young white tail doe that lived its life among the corn and soybeans of its home range will have a higher PQ than a similarly aged doe that lived in a cattail slough in North Dakota. But be aware that PQ is highly subjective. One hunter may like a certain funk associated with the mule deer rut, <clears throat> Brooks, but that might reduce the, the PQ for another hunter who wants a milder <laughs> taste profile to their venison. Should we spill the beans now, Brooks, that we are going to be hunting together in Montana where the PQ will be a primary driver of our activity? Um, yes. Let's spill the beans. We will be chasing rutting deer. Yes. Which which I am fine with. The the cool thing about this is as I listen to you describe this and talk about this, it's so cool that we can we can look at an animal and we can see what it's gonna do for us individually and how it's gonna feed. And like usually when I shoot an animal, um, I'm contemplating, all right, before I break this down, I've got to make sure that this, this, and this happens because I got to make sure I have this cut and this cut because these are some of my favorite ways to cook that cut of meat. So don't ruin that while you're butchering it if you have in a place where you have to pack it out. Or if we can get it out whole, we can yield so much more meat. And so anyway, just like listening to this, you can do all that. But that also doesn't have to take away and feel shame that you're still wanting to like pursue an animal of horse. Like there's so much of that, that all goes in together. So am I making any sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, and actually, I'm, I really appreciate that. It, it is, it's kind of like an all of the above. I, but this is probably a reaction to my sense that I don't think we as a community take into account quite as much 
we don't elevate the cable fare aspect of the animal sort of as regularly as we do gasp at the horn qualities or quantities. Absolutely. But I'm with you. I mean, I, you know, I, uh, for many years, in fact, it still happens. When I look at an animal through my rifle scope, I'm looking at where I'd like to place the shot, but then like something happens and I, in my mind's eye, I picture it's always a cast iron skillet. And it's always <laughs> like a tubular piece of meat spitting in oil with a sprig of rosemary on top. I am not kidding. I see that through the scope as I'm aiming at an, at an animal. Like, so, so I had this buddy, we got together, we were talking. And he was telling me stories about hunting these deer. And he's like, and I went, it was an antelope, a deer. Um, I think there's an axis involved. There's like three or four animals. And he's like, and for like those three or four animals, I kept um, shooting them in the guts. I was a little far back. And he goes, and I said, why? He goes, every one of them. I don't, and I said, I finally figured out what it was. I was so concerned with blowing up the shoulder and ruining the meat that I put my aim point a little too far back and I ended up going to the guts rather than right there. Cause there's just such a tiny little crease. If you, you know, if you're off by six or eight inches, you're going to, you're going to hit guts rather than just holding on the shoulder. And he goes, I just had to relax and just hold on the shoulder. And then all of a sudden everything was fine. But anyway, he told the story how he was so concerned about ruining the meat that he ended up gut shooting them. And then there was a little more involved in cleaning them just to make sure that things were clean. So, but so, anyway, in your guys' opinion, what animal is the highest on the PQ scale? Oof. Oh, wow. For me, it's a pronghorn antelope. I absolutely love pronghorn. Um, it's a it, it's a funny meat because it's, you know, it, it, at least in my country, antelope live in just the kind of the sagebrush, not wasteland. It's some of my favorite parts of my county, but it's not... Um, it's not the alfalfa fields that whitetail does are in. You know, it's pretty much native range, and you kind of wonder what they're eating and how can an animal that has that as its diet taste that good? But they are wonderfully mild flavored, beautiful meat. I don't know. How about I, you, Brooks? I so I'm right there with you with an antelope, and a pronghorn is absolutely delicious. And people look at me like I'm crazy when I tell them it's one of my favorite eating wild games. The two that are my favorite. Like, don't get me wrong, I like it all. I mean, you could tell by my pear-shaped figure. But I like elk and, and you know, the things that you moose, all those things you hear about, they're good. Like, I like them a lot. I'm never going to turn it down. And a mule deer, they're browsing on buckbrush, like uh, willow brush and just leaves and sagebrush and things like that. But if you take care of those right, I think it is so delicious. I remember I was recently on a hunt and we cleaned off the back strap and I just sliced a little piece off and ate it. And everybody looked at me like I was going to die. But I'm like, this is the most mild, most delicious piece of meat ever. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so my heart, I always go back to that mule deer and pronghorn. Like those are my two favorite. I can't just pick one. Now I harvested a bear last year and I had heard so much negative talk about bear meat. And I don't know, I killed it in the fall. So it was super fatty. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if killing them in the spring versus the fall is what makes the huge difference. Uh, but, and I can't say that bear is my favorite wild game because that's the only bear I've eaten. But that bear that I ate was some of the best wild game I've ever eaten. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know what it was about it, but uh, it was just so stinking good. It was fatty. It was sweet. It was, I mean, it was delicious. I, uh, one of my favorite things to do with it, Brooks, was uh, slice it up and throw it on the the camp chef uh, s the skillet top um, and uh, and make bear meat tacos, and it was just fantastic. Hmm, that's awesome. That's awesome. But well, again, I, I don't know. You know, I don't yeah. know if bear's my favorite or just that bear happened to be really good. You know, and I think I it's with everything. Like you can have really good bear, and you can also have really bad bear. I've had bad bear. I tried like crazy to cook a bear a year ago and did everything and it looked the pictures and everything looked amazing but it didn't taste as good as it as it looked that particular recipe did another recipe and it was fine i wonder too like dylan you kind of i think brought up one of the big considerations for bear i've had nothing but wonderful fall bear fatty sleek 
spring bear can be a little stringy. And I think that really puts a premium on how you cook it. Yeah. But some of the best sausage I've ever made, uh, mule deer sausage, I ground with bear fat and fatty bear meat. And there's just something about the melting point and the kind of the viscosity, if I can use that word, with the bear fat made a wonderful sausage. Now, that is bear meat for me. If you're looking to make breakfast sausage, that is fantastic. Um, I ended up making like breakfast pizzas with uh, bear meat sausage. And uh, I'm trying to make a T-shirt right now that just says bear meat for breakfast. Um because uh, I'd love to wear that, but uh, no, I, uh, I I love the bear. But but other than that, if I had to say, in general, my favorite animal uh, would have to be uh, pheasant and quail. I think those are just those are easily at the top of my list. But on your scoring sheet, they might score really high in the PQ, but you don't get a ton of meat off of them, so um, it makes it makes it rough. So let's tie that in there now. So that actually. That actually brings up the next element of the TEMI, the total meat index. So we have what's called the abundance booster. And you're exactly, you're anticipating this perfectly. So as I say, we need to account for the relative scarcity of the animal in our sights and with luck on our plates. A species that is relatively uncommon, think bighorn sheep or oscillated turkey, will have a higher AB than a whitetail uh, or an eastern wild turkey simply because we have the opportunity to ingest them so infrequently. But I think what we're also talking about here is the abundance booster should also be the amount of meat that you get off the, each animal too, right? So as toothsome and wonderful as antelope is, there's really not a lot of it. Certainly if you compare it to an elk, you're talking about quail and pheasant. I love them too, but there's, they don't, there's just not enough of them. And so they're going to score just a little bit lower there because we don't have the, the biomass of the abundance of them. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, um, so my family, every Thanksgiving uh, has a wild turkey, um, has pheasant and quail, and that's kind of our Thanksgiving dinner. And if you've hunted pheasant and quail all season long, it's gone in that dinner. I mean, you 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 only get that dinner out of it. Whereas opposed to an elk, I mean, you could feed your family 20 times with it. Um, and, and when I say family, I'm talking like my big family, moms, dads, cousins, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters. So you hunt all year long for pheasants. It's gone in one evening. Um, and then you're sitting there and you're like, crap, now I got to wait a whole nother year for meat. Uh, I should have saved some for myself. Um, so yeah, it's, it's rough, you know, because you got to hunt so much of them and kill so many of them just to make one big cookout meal out of them. Maybe you should invite fewer family. Yeah. Only the ones I like. Or just, or, cook. just don't in, or don't invite any family and just eat it by yourself. <laughs> or just cook less of it, and then once it's gone, it's gone. I mean, sorry. Sorry, we're out. That's all we have. Don't look in my freezer, please. <laughs> okay, the last of the components of this uh, meat index is called the sweat equity index, or the SEI. My favorite part of it. This is the amount of work required to bring the meat to your table. So a high SEI is achieved in a backpack hunt, in which you have to, might have to make multiple muscle searing hikes from the kill to your pickup, carrying the meat out of the field in a backpack, examples of a low SEI hunt, a farmland deer hunt, in which you drove your pickup right up next to your whitetail carcass. Uh, and as I say in here, I might have to kind of remind myself why I said it. Note that the SEI can be inverse, inversely proportionate to both the TMI and the PQ. Okay, that makes sense. Because obviously the PQ, the um, palatability quotient, if you can just drive right up to it, as Brooks mentioned before, you're likely to get more meat if you can get the whole carcass out at once versus having to lop it up, chop it up, and bag it out in the backcountry. And then, of course, the... Uh, the total meat index is a, is a big part of that too. But I do think, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say this out loud and then get your feedback on it. So last year we had the great fortune of between my daughter and myself, we shot two elk. She shot a bull. I shot a cow in the Missouri river breaks. The bull she shot was in the back country, but it was steep. We could roll it down and we ended up getting a ranch truck to load it whole. It yielded a lot of meat. The old, uh, palatability index was high, the, to the total meat index was high. My cow in the backcountry was a whole different critter. I had to chop it into quarters and then parts of quarters, and I got it out in five trips. 
um, each about six and a half miles long. Based on that, I'm going to kind of use the old sweat index or sweat equity index here to work. You would think that my cow would have tasted so much better than her bull. I just put more of myself into it, a lot more sweat equity into it. But no, it was not the case. That cow was tough, tasted good, but was not an old cow either. And my buddy actually had a really interesting take on it. Uh, this buddy did not have a chance to harvest an elk, and so I ended up giving him half of my cow. I thought it was the right thing to do, uh, even though he had not helped me pack it out. We had a lot of elk in our household, and I just felt like a giver at the time. So he got half my cow, and he mentioned to me, he said, hey, thanks a lot for that meat. I loved it, but, you know, that was a little tough. <laughs> He's like, is that why you gave it to me? I said, no, I, I wanted you to have elk meat. I mean, nobody is turning down elk meat. But we kind of actually reviewed it a little bit his take on it was and he's a big time meat hunter because that cow did not have a chance to hang and stretch instead pretty soon after it was dead and on the ground i was whacking it up while it was still warm and putting it in game bags and hiking it out his take on it is it didn't have time to really sort of cure to tenderize by hanging and i think there's actually something to it i certainly put a lot of sweat equity into getting that cow out but maybe just because I took her out in pieces. It was a tougher cut of meat. I'm not sure. So your What's sweat equity perspective on that. So yeah, your sweat I, equity increased, but the PQ decreased. There you go. Nice way to use that. Interesting. Uh, I mean, I'm all for dry aging anything. If you got an opportunity to dry age an animal, I think it's gonna. It's proven in everything that you do, whether it be domestic beef or chickens or whatever it is to to wild game. It just allows that muscle to break down and stretch and and loosen up and it makes it that much more tender. Um, I also feel like dry aging on the bone is infinitely better than dry aging a piece of meat that's already been cut off the bone. There's something about leaving it in its natural case on the bone and dry aging it that way opposed to broken down. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that's what you experience because I've killed animals in the back country where you have to basically order them out because that's the only way you're gonna get them out of there unless you wanted to spend the next year call a helicopter. Um, and by doing that, it's harder to dry age when you get home because it's already almost bagged up. You can trim it up and just freeze it and be done. You've almost started to do most of the work. So, it, yeah. I think you are right on. I also noticed something else about that that cow that I backpacked out of the brakes. I, I felt like there was more blood in the muscles, and, I, and it kind of makes some sense if you think about it. Like that bull that my daughter shot, we gutted it rather than gutless methoding, methoding it. So. You know, we were able to get the blood out of the cavity. We were able to kind of have sort of all of the draining process through mm -hmm. veins, capillaries, everything. There was time for that to happen. When you shoot an animal and then immediately get to quartering and boning, you don't allow that blood to naturally leave the muscles. And so I also think that that had a toughening factor yeah. to it. I definitely noticed I, when I was grinding it, there was just more blood and moisture in the meat. I think for years, the, the way I was trained was you, you gut the animal. Like my dad always told me, get the guts out of that thing as fast as humanly possible. It's going to spoil. We can't, you know, well, first of all, get out the old Wonder Bread bag that you've got in your, in your saddlebags and put the liver in it. Once the liver's in it, we got to gut that thing. Get the right, you know, get in there, got to get the liver, save all that stuff. Make sure that bag's ready for the liver. That was always the first thing that my dad and grandpa said liver i wasn't a fan of liver but we had to save it for them so anyway we, that's the only way i was taught was you just you clean the animal and then as kind of tar time marched on i'd say in the early 2000s everything was about gutless don't get guts on your hands don't worry about that just gutless method it's a lot easier because you can just pull off the quarters pack it out that way because when we'd be in the back country we were fortunate enough to have horses we would gut them then we'd cut them in half if it was a deer, we'd cut it in half. If it was an elk, we'd have to quarter it, but we'd always gut it first. Because, and I think the reasoning behind that is my grandfather always said is to get all the blood out and it drains the blood a lot quicker and the meat's going to taste a lot better. I think it's just kind of the way that people had to do stuff before refrigeration. I'm not saying they lived before there's refrigerators, but refrigeration wasn't as available as it is, say, now in the you know, 21st century. So, anyway, that's what we'd always do. And then all of a sudden, this transition to gutless method pull the quarters off gutless don't even worry about it indian quarter whatever they want to call it i have like 
not made it a point, but I think of all the animals that I've recently killed in the last five years, I've got it every single one of them. I actually think it's faster. It's cleaner. And then I quarter it up after you're not worried. Like the whole time you're doing it, you're, you're worried about punching the guts when you're trying to get the, the tenderloins out and you mess those up and you don't get the whole tenderloin out. And I'm like, you know what? It takes you literally 10 minutes to gut a deer. If you've got two people, somebody holds the, the legs, you can get the guts out so fast and it makes it so much easier. Now, so. <clears throat> I've got a question on aging. Before I do, uh, let me make mention of some of my friends. That this conversation is perfectly fitting uh, for my friends over over at Rebel Six Seasonings or Rubs. Um, they make different rubs for all different types of wild game, uh, so you can buy your 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 whitetail, your spicy whitetail, your Midwest fish, your your sweet bear. I mean, all these different seasonings for different wild game, and uh, I think that's why the bear meat was so good. Was I was accompanying it with a sweet bear meat rub. Just absolutely fantastic rubs. Uh, so go check out Rebel Six, and uh, you can use code Bear One Hundred and One uh, for twenty percent off at checkout. Um, so go check out those guys because they make some incredible rubs for different wild games. Um, now, what's the benefits and downsides for for dry aging rather than just soaking it? You're talking um, about when you're preparing it for the pan. No, um, I mean like so. So, for instance, when I cut off when I cut up a whitetail, um, I don't have the place to hang it. Um, so I simply uh, fill like 110 quart coolers with ice water um, and soak the meat before I before I break it down. What's the benefits downsides uh, of both? I I think like the benefit to dry age is the whole idea is to get the moisture and the blood out of the animal um, and. When you're soaking it, I, I'd assume that would be more like um, uh, more like a brine. And brine is what I usually do with poultry, is you're taking out the blood and replacing it with a salt. It's drawing it out and putting a salt content in it. Um, I don't know the major benefits to just soaking it in ice water. I know I've heard of a few people doing it. I personally have never done it. Um, I'll, usually, I'll usually just let it hang and, and dry age that way. Luckily, we live in a place where it's, cross your fingers that it's cold enough that i can put it in the shade or in the shed we have like a shed that we'll hang them in and it's cold enough that uh, that it can dry age in there so you don't have to worry about the cooler side i don't know andrew what are your thoughts yeah i've the reason i hang meat is exactly that to get the blood out of it but also i think it does a couple things if i hang a deer um with the skin on We've got an old front loader tractor that's, I don't know how many deer and elk it's had on its forks, but you know, in, in the time we've had it. But the nice thing about that is you can hang it, I hang it head down, the, the blood comes out of it. It's easier to skin that way too. But even if I'm hanging just hot quarters that I've pulled out of the back country, I'll also do that without the skin on them. And one of the nice things about that is I feel like it not only dry ages it and as Brooke said, kind of stretches those meat fibers and allows that curing to happen. But it'll also form, you know, kind of an oxide rind that's then really easy to just fillet off. And with that comes all of any of the grime and dirt and all that stuff. And so it's, it makes such a nice cut of meat that's then ready for either the pan or the freezer. So, and I have a feeling it just kind of concentrates a little bit, just that oxidization process I think it enhances the flavor a little bit. I, I'd worry a little bit about the soaking because I feel like it would sort of dilute rather than intensify the flavor. So here's what I got. Um, <clears throat> first off, I before I read this, I found it on muleyfreak.com. Uh, you know, I have no relationship with those guys, but thank you for, for validating my methods, I guess. Um, now I do, so I go probably 10 days um in the cooler and every two days i'll dump the water out and put new water out because the water gets all bloody and nasty and so you know i dump the water put new ice and water in it uh this basically says uh talks about dry aging and the benefits of it um wet curing meat is just as effective and far more controllable for most hunters not all apparently um, the cooler method is more closely related to the process of brining than others you may have heard of for example dry aging brining brining is best suited for those meats with low fat content such as wild game 
Brining uses the process of osmosis to deliver the salty solution into the meat. It equalizes the salt levels and breaks down the muscle fibers so they can hold more moisture, creating a more tender and flavorful bite. This process also deprives any bacteria uh, of the moisture it needs to thrive, which in turn keeps your meat fresh. And then it goes through the process, uh, which I won't dive into because it's like an eight-part process, which really, in essence, it's pretty simple. Break down your animal as you would, put it in ice water, um, change up, and then butcher it when you're done. But uh, yeah, so just just Googled that and found it on muleyfreak.com. But no, I was just curious. Um, and, and there's an article on the meateater.com on how to wet age meat. Uh, I would imagine it's the exact same thing. But yeah, I was just curious to know if you guys had any any super benefits or downsides to one way or the other. Hey, Dylan, just a point of clarification. So when you're wet aging meat in a cooler, is it, is it like a whole quarter still on the bone? Yes. You put that whole quarter? Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, well, I mean, it. yes, uh, but that article went into, you know, however you're used to breaking down an animal, break it down and do it. I do it in quarters. Um, and then I, once I go through the aging process, then I butcher it, um, into, you know, cookable portions. Gotcha. Hmm. Yeah. I think anything that you do to remove the blood is going to help that animal be more tender and taste better. So I'm sure there's several methods out there and uh, dry aging is one. I always, I look at it as like, let's take the human body and let's say that I head over to my gold's gym and I work out. I'm working as hard as I can and I've been lifting some weights and I've been doing the treadmill or whatever. My body's going to be, my muscles are going to be intense and they're going to be tight and they're not going to be loose because they've been working really hard. And if I went and just sat on the couch and relaxed for two or three hours after or five hours, everything's just going to relax and just settle down. And that's really like when you're chasing an animal, a lot of times they're working, they're moving, they're up, they might be spooked, they might not. But that, that meat's really tough and tight. And when you shoot them, and then once you dry age them, it's just going to relax and let it just, uh, I don't know, just let nature do its thing. And now, it's kinda, <clears throat> I don't know what it is exactly. I don't know the science behind it because I'm the farthest thing from any type of biologist now, but, uh, or, or meat specialist, butcher, I should say. But uh, it, there's something in the process where the blood goes out the the fibers loosen up everything becomes relaxed and you're going to have an infinitely better cut of meat yeah i mean if you're going to so i mean if you think about a workout um you have to get the blood out of the muscles because the blood in the muscles is what keeps them pumped up um, yeah. now i will say this though meat eater does it complete or at least their website the article i'm reading says they do it completely different than what i'm talking about wet aging is relatively new Essentially, all you do is vacuum seal your meat and leave it in the fridge for 7 to 28 days. Um, the, enzy the enzymes are still at work breaking down the tissue, and the bag seals out air to prevent contamination. This is a much easier process that can be done to frozen meat. In fact, many times I take meat from the freezer a week before I plan to cook it and allow it to age. So what they're talking about is the actual broken down cuts of meat uh, wet aging it before they cook it. Hmm. Like I say, any any method you use to help uh, the process or the benefit of better tasting meat, I say do it. But here it you go. Like there's lots lots of them out there. The downside to wet aging is that the meat does not concentrate and develop the depth of of flavor the way dry aging can because there's no water loss or mold growth. It does, however, rest in a bag of its own juices and blood, adding what most consider gamey flavor. But again, he's doing a bit different than I do. Um, but there's one of the downsides. So there you go. Now, sounds like we might have to put the old uh, palatability index to work on that business. I mean, what what's a tool do if you it. don't use it? What about yeah. butter aging or, or whatever you call that? What's it called? Oh. I don't know if you said butter and lost me right there. <laughs> well, have Anytime you, seen you that? add butter to anything. Now, well, have you seen that where they like put a steak, they, they, they coat a steak in butter and let it age inside butter for like 60 days or whatever it is. And then they break off the butter and cook it. I want to try it. Does it come with clogged arteries? Yes. 
Yes, it does. But uh, no, I, I, I've had it once and it was just a, a, a cut of Wagyu um, and uh, they did it and they, they really he did it for like two weeks when you're supposed to do it for a lot longer. Um, and really all you got was a super buttery steak. <laughs> but it was very, very good. Of course, it was Wagyu. I mean, you're not going to argue with that. Yeah. Um, awesome. Now, I, I do want to go back uh, because I, I feel like the sweat equity is what a lot of people just don't understand. Uh, and, and mainly non-hunters don't understand it. Um, because an animal can taste to the person who harvested it and put in the work it's going to taste completely different than the one just sitting down to eat it. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know if this falls into, um, I don't, the, I don't remember the other initials you said, uh, basically how often you get to hunt them or how accessible they are to hunt. Um, but if you've been like prepping for a hunt and preparing for a hunt, uh, and wanting to go on a hunt for, for several years, um, like a, like an elk hunt, um, if you've wanted to go on an elk hunt for several years and you finally get to do it, uh, that meat is going to be so much better than, than the guy who gets to, to hunt elk every year. And that's just how it goes. Um, you know, I find it strange when people are like, man, I've always wanted to hunt a whitetail. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're everywhere. Like, just go hunt them. And like, well, they're not here. They're not where I'm at. And uh, I'm like, well, you can, you see them in my backyard, you know? Um, and so they just taste different. They taste better. They taste, you know, I don't know. And so, I feel like the sweat equity is just something that people don't understand until they actually go out and experience it for themselves. I think there's something to that. Um, I, I, I'm going to give try to explain myself by way of example. Um, so I think it kind of goes both ways. I have a friend of mine here in town who has never hunted before, has expressed interest in it a couple of times, and, and I've either been busy or anyway – uh, I finally decided maybe one way to introduce him to the concept was to share my, some meat with him. And I had a beautiful, um, the way I, I, I had a freezer package of a mule deer backstrap. And typically when, when I butcher it, I'll write on it, very good backstrap or holiday backstrap to kind of differentiate it from maybe you know, the, the front end of the backstrap's got a lot of that neck roast and kind of it's shot through with some of that. Um, the interstitial muscles is the best way to put it and you know and and tendons and stuff this was the biggest part of the rear back strap i mean it was a, a vg i said on my freezer pack and so very good so i i gave it to him i said hey this is just a little offering to kind of get you excited about hunting um well i don't i didn't want to be you know that guy and say here's how you must cook this i i just sort of said hey if you have questions about it just let me know and he never asked and nothing was ever said for a couple of months. And finally I said, Hey, do you ever have that, that mule deer backstrap? And he's like, Oh yeah, had it. And I was like, Oh, it didn't go well, did it? He's like, yeah, my wife's not really excited about me hunting. Um, I just totally flopped that whole interchange and exchange of, you know, meat and everything. And I think the thing is mule deer can, and I remember it was not a rut season mule deer. It was not a buck. I think it was a doe. Anyway, my expectation of how that was going to taste partly from having years of it, partly from being the one who shot it, butchered it and had that, as you're saying, Dylan, like that intimate relationship with it was just a lot different than giving him a hunk of meat and having his wife cook it with no relationship with that meat at all. And so I think sometimes we as hunters, we know where the meat came from. We know exactly the ridge it was on. We know what happened from the minute it was on the hoof to it went into our freezer and then our plate. That adds an element of satisfaction that you don't get if you're just offered a piece of meat. And then whether it was overcooked, I don't know any of those details, but I think you're onto something. That sweat equity index maybe is a flip for the hunter itself, him or herself, but maybe it's a devaluing or even like a negative flavor booster for people who just don't have a relationship with that cut of meat. I've I talked can almost too much. promise you it was overcooked. Uh, everybody, I mean... There's such a, a, a misconception that if it's wild game, it has to be overcooked. I mean, it's it almost it's almost as though like when you tell people, well, cook it, cook it medium or medium rare. They're like, what? It's wild game. And I'm like, so like <laughs> they're like, well, I don't want to catch any sort of diseases or anything. I'm like, but yet you'll cook the processed meat from the grocery store that that's 
pumped full of all these different chemicals and things, you'll cook that medium rare, but you won't cook the pure organic meat that I know where it came from and I know what it went through. You won't cook that medium rare. And I'll also go back to what you said. Um, the entire process makes it taste better. So um, if you just drop it off at the butcher and then you come back and pick it up, it's not going to taste near as good as if you did it yourself. A lot of that has to do with, with, you know, you going through the proper steps and then just rushing through it and it goes through all different piles and it's mixed with all different deer and, you know, not taking care of the way it should. A lot of that has to do with it. But I do think a lot of it is just you experienced the process. You went through it yourself. You, from, like you said, from on the hoof to in your freezer, you did it all. You know the steps that were taken. You know where your meat was, how it was handled, and it just tastes better. Very cool. Yeah, I think there's so much to be said about the effort in obtaining or harvesting that animal. There's a, there's a story behind it, and uh, and that's that's what I would call like an emotional connection to you and whatever you pursue. Absolutely. Well, guys, I thank you so much for for taking time to come on and just talking wild game. Um, you know, I understand that that this new method of scoring animals. Um, may not sweep the nation but it's something to consider next time you go to harvest an animal uh it's not always about antler size it's not always about uh what it'll make in the books uh but but rather uh the work that was taken in some of my favorite some of my best trophies were were well my still to this day one of my favorite trophies was a doe i shot uh and it was because it was on my grandparents place with my dad and i got to share it with my my grandparents and and drive it up to the house and show them. And, you know, it was taken off the land that my family was kind of raised on. And so um, it has nothing to do with the size of the animal. And so maybe some of these things will be things to consider for you next time uh, you go to harvest an animal and, and uh, you know, what deer are going to make your shooter list and what deer you're going to pass on. Maybe some of these things will, will come into consideration. Um, before we go, uh, quick thank you to our friends over at Nexus Outdoors. Our friend Steve Alley from Nexus was actually supposed to join us today. Uh, he's got a sick uh, kid and wife, so I hope everything goes well with him. I hope they have quick, speedy recoveries, and uh, and and I hate to see little kids who are sick and they don't understand why. So, so hopefully uh, that'll all get wrapped up and 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 taken care of. He's a huge foodie. Um, he makes some of the craziest looking dishes I've ever seen. Uh, so I wanted to have him on, but. Uh, can't help kids being sick but anyways go check out our friends over at nexus outdoors the powerhouses of scent lock scent blocker oz by scent lock tree spider um i personally only wear scent lock i have fallen in love with their gear um so go check out scent lock and scent blocker um guys again thank you so much for coming on i appreciate it um i can't wait to uh brooks man i wish you were coming to reno in, in july and we could we could set up some camp chefs outside the convention center and and throw down some meat, but uh, you know, I guess we'll have I to got just you. we'll have to do next it without time. you next time. I think you'll do fine without me. I wish I could get there too. It's just uh, it's a it's a crazy summer. We'll put it at that. Very crazy. I told my wife we were sitting there counting, and uh, you know, out of all the mar mountain archery fest events and total archery challenge events and uh, Pope and Young convention, and I, I think I'm gone like something like 48 days of the two months she's out of school for summer so um not fun but you know that's how it goes so well gentlemen thank you so much for coming on again i appreciate it um make sure and check out camp chef all of their stuff make sure and check out uh montana mckean.com no i'm just kidding you don't have your own website do you <laughs> no i don't i'm a i'm just i ride on everybody else kind of like a parasite yep. You can uh, check out all of Andrew's work, Outdoor Life. Where all do you write at? Where can all they check out your, your, your yeah, stuff at? Yeah, OutdoorLife.com, Peterson's Hunting, Game and Fish. Uh, I just finished last night a piece for this British uh, sporting magazine. Just a little bit of everywhere. Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever. You know. Pretty soon, Pope and Young. Well, and Pope and Young. <laughs> well, and I have to end. The only thing I'll say is what my dad always said when it was a good end of a good dinner. He would say, bon appetit. I think he meant to say bon appetit, but that was Missouri for you. <laughs> and we'll end with that. <laughs> <laughs>